grace was rolling around in my spirit when I was laying there in the hospital in the middle of the night and the word was Psalms 103 bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the Lord O my soul forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases the Lord was telling me that if I will bless him he will heal me he goes on and says he redeems your life from destruction and he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies You see, worship is for him. Preaching is for us. When we worship him, we are giving him the sacrifice of our praise. In the Old Testament, God's people were commanded to bring an an offering, a sacrifice, an incense to burn before the Lord. Under the new covenant that we now live in, that sacrifice is our praise. It's our worship. We don't bring the sacrifice of blood and animals. We bring the sacrifice of thanksgiving unto our God. Why is it a sacrifice of thanksgiving? Because in Christ, he has given us all things. Everything you need is yours in Christ. He has blessed us with every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus. So I just want to pray over you right now. Whatever you need, he's here to give you all thanks. I want you to begin to just by faith start thanking Jesus for whatever it is you need. Because he gave his life to give you and I his life. The zoe of God, the life of God. He said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. It's that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. So would you just receive that by thanking him right now? Whatever you need. Father, I thank you that I am healed by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he took my diseases and that he healed my body. And that you have crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercies. He's calling your healing the mercies of God. And his mercies are new every morning. So Father, I thank you that your mercies are new right now. Healing mercies are being released right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that your healing, any of our members that are struggling with COVID right now. Lord, I know we lift up... uh, Glendale, Father, God, you're, you're healing her in Jesus' name. And Lord, anyone else who's watching this broadcast that is suffering from COVID, we release healing in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you that we are your children and healing is the children's bread. Would you just receive that right now? Start thanking him. Say, Lord, I thank you that I am healed by the stripes of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we receive that tonight. We thank you that we are the healed. You know, oftentimes we don't follow what Jesus said. He said, when you pray, offer up thanksgiving. You have to believe, you receive, and then you have to give thanks, he said. So let's believe that we have received and let's give thanks. I laid there in the hospital thanking God that my lungs were being healed, that that this COVID pneumonia was leaving my body, that I would live and not die, even in spite of what the evidence was saying. You know, there's an old saying that fear is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. We don't deny that there's evidence that there's a disease, a problem, but what we are saying is that the great physician, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
has the final authority. And we're coming to him right now for the great physician's second opinion. Hallelujah. What does he got to say about my condition? Well, he says, by my stripes, I healed you. So, Father, we thank you that we are the healed. We are the healed, and we thank you that we are healed because your word says that by his stripes, we were healed. That Jesus healed everyone that came to him with sickness and disease, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying that he took our infirmity and bore our sicknesses and with his stripes we are healed. So, Father, we thank you for that. We receive it tonight in Jesus' name. Come on, just thank him. If you're watching this online, lay your hand on your body and say, Lord, I thank you that I am healed in Jesus' name. I receive that in Jesus' name. In fact, just say this, say this after me. This disease, this sickness is a lie. Just say that because it is a lie. It's a, it's a lie of the enemy he wants to use that to take you down, to take you out. But Jesus came to redeem our life from destruction. He said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and don't forget all his benefits. There's a reason David was inspired to pen that psalm. And I want to encourage you, begin to bless the Lord and receive the promise of that psalm. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing. Thank you, Jesus, for your freedom. Thank you, Jesus, for your deliverance in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. Praise God. Well, you may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Praise God. God's presence is here tonight. I want to welcome everyone here tonight. Praise God. Glad you are here. Hey, get your phone out, your smartphone out. This is our opportunity to worship God with our tithe and our offerings. If you go to the Liberty Church app, you can just click the give button. If you're watching, just click the button that's right there online. And let's worship God with our giving. Amen. The Bible commands us that on the first day of every week, we're supposed to bring to the Lord all that we have laid aside as an offering, the first fruit of all of our increase. First fruits is a, is a term in the Old Testament that, really, that literally means we give to God back the first 10% of all that we have received in our employment, whatever your employment might be. And so we just thank you, God, for the privilege of sowing. Can you just come into agreement with me? And I want to say thank you, Liberty family, for your faithful support, for your gifts to this church. And, Father, I thank you that your word says, he that sows sparingly, and you're talking about money, reaps sparingly, but he that sows liberally will reap bountifully. And I thank you, Father, for a bountiful harvest from your people. I thank you as we give, Father, that promise is activated in Jesus' name because you gave it. We didn't make it up, Lord. You're the one who said, give and it will be given unto you. And he that sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. He that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. We receive that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. If you're present here and you brought an offering, uh, there will be offering containers on your way out at the, each exit door. Thank you for your generous support of liberty. Amen. Praise God. Well, are you ready for the word tonight? Come on. Are you ready for the word tonight? I do believe God has a word for us. So I want you to put a demand on the Holy Spirit because Pastor Sam has a word that's been stirring in his heart, and he's going to be bringing that word for us tonight. Let's give a big liberty welcome to Pastor Sam. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Richard. It's, um, it's, it's a powerful time right now, being a Christian. It really is a powerful time because I believe that God is putting a demand on our faith. Some of you are going, uh-oh. That means we have to have faith. God's putting a demand on our faith. And what we have to understand is the reason why he's putting a demand on our faith is because, you see, when we 
step out in faith, God gets happy. He gets really happy. And so as I'm speaking to you tonight about what God's put on my heart, and not just my heart, he's actually put it on the heart of the pastors here at Liberty. Um, just so you know, we, we had a pastoral meeting this, this week. We usually meet on Tuesdays, and we're praying, we're meeting, we go over business, and we go over what God's saying, you know. And we talked about what God was saying to each one of us, and it turned out to be the same thing. Can you imagine that? I mean, you know it's a miracle when you've got a bunch of pastors in the room and they're thinking the same thing. <laughs> well, pastors got that. <laughs> At any rate, but one of the things that God put on our hearts was the term that God is with us. God is with us. And, you know, I was thinking about that and it just kept stirring in my heart. And so he is with us is a theme, but what does that look like? What do we have to do with that? What's it mean? And I just want to unpack a couple of things that I believe that it means. One is God shows us in his word many times when he says he is with us, it's because we're going through some things. Uh-oh. Are we going through some things today? Right? All of us know somebody that's dealt with COVID. We know people that are dealing with situations with their finances. We know people are dealing with situations with their emotions. There's a lot of things that are going on a lot more than years ago. So things are heightened right now. Even mental illness heightened. So we are going through some things. And, and when I looked this up and I was like in the scriptures and I was like, God keeps saying God is with us. Why is he saying that? Because we need him. And we need to know that he is with us. And then secondly, he wants us to draw near to him. He wants us to know that he's with us and then now our part is to draw near to him when he's with us, right? When we have that understanding that God is with us, it opens up our hearts more. See, when we don't think he's with us, then we're like, oh, he ain't with us and not gonna worry about it. But when we know that he's with us, there's an action that we can take that we can actually take advantage of being with him. Not in a bad way, but advantage of having that relationship with him and gaining some understanding that we don't normally have. And it's, I, I believe that's vitally important. But one of the things that we gotta realize is we have this Western mindset that seems to get in the way. And what I mean by that is like, for instance, we'll read in Romans, chapter 8, verse 31, and he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Great scripture. We love quoting that one, right? God for us, who can be against us? But the problem is, in our Western mindset, it's kind of like we're watching Marvel movies or DC or what have you, and you've got Superman coming in and he's gonna rescue you right out of your situation, right? I mean, we tend to think that way. Be honest with yourself. It's like even when we're praying, we're thinking, God, come and just smite that enemy and I'll be okay because you're my God. And that really is a Western mindset. That's, that's not what the Bible says. Now, I, I know there are times that that can happen, right? But for the most part, we have to walk things out with God. We're walking it out with him. God explains his mindset. Are you ready for his mindset? He tells it plainly to us in Isaiah 55. 
And it's verse 8 and 9. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Oops. He says, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So my question would be is what part of that don't we understand? I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I know better than God. Now, I don't say that. Obviously, that would be pretty dumb. But religious me would say, I'm not thinking that way, but I think we could do it this way, Lord. Wouldn't that be good? And he goes, son, my word says my thoughts are not your thoughts. Now, the good news is, though, we can get his thoughts. That's what's amazing about having a relationship with God. We can get his thoughts, but we, we got to do a few things. We have to humble ourselves, number one. And that's the thing that we have to understand is when we humble ourselves before him, okay, one, it says he will lift us up, but we have to go through that process of being humble and understanding he is God. And even though he, he, his ways are not our ways, we also have to understand the other half of that where it's higher than our ways, higher than our thoughts. And that's why we want to seek him more to get his thoughts, to understand his ways, as opposed to just trying to figure it out ourselves. How many of you like figuring it out yourself? I don't know, every time I do that, it doesn't work out so well. I don't know what it is. I, I think I'm pretty smart, but I'm not as smart as God, right? And so why do I even want to mess with my own wisdom when I can freely get the wisdom of God, right? So anyway, so to find out a couple of things here, we need to know God's process. And if you are going through something now, Here's the process. Psalms 23, verse 4. It says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's, here's the word. For you are with me. There it is. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, here's, here's the thing. We, we all talk about it. I mean, we've all heard the jokes. Like if it's, I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death, keep going, keep going, don't stay there, right? That's a good word, that's a good word. But understand, we are able to go through because he is with us. He's with us. And then he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So it's a comfort when you're going through the valley of shadow of death, when you're going through COVID, when you're going through problems. I remember I had COVID. Three weeks, I'm laid out. I'm just laying there. And as a matter of fact, it was kind of twerking me that people were always checking up on me. That's how bad I felt. It was like, really? I, I really don't want to answer right now. I'm too tired. Seriously. You know, you're, you're just exhausted, all sorts of stuff. And then things go through your mind. Oh my gosh, am I going to end up in the ER? <laughs> I'm short of breath. What's going to happen? You know, I mean, I, I really had to fight myself. This was back in October. And the thing that I had to fight is the fact that you kept seeing on the news, fear, fear, all these people going to the hospital. And I'm, I was like going... I had to shut it off and I just had to get with the Lord and just say, Lord, I trust you. You can take me or you can keep me here. I'm trusting you, right? Because that's where my trust lies is with him. We trust in the Lord with all of our heart. We don't lean on our own understanding, on what we know. We just acknowledge him in everything that we do, wherever we're at. Pastor Richard has given us great examples where he was at. 
There's others, same type of thing, whether it's sickness, whether it's you're out of a job, no matter what it is, our trust is in him, right? And I'm going to go over some details about that in just a little bit, but here's the thing that I want you to get. When you walk through um, the valley of the shadow of death or wherever you're going, whatever you're going through, what's happening is it's a maturing process that God is working you in. Hello. You didn't, you didn't get all happy about that. It's a maturing process, right? And, and what happens is when you, when you mature, that means you are getting experience. If you notice in any sport, right, when all of a sudden you've been, pra you've, you've been practicing before and you're doing your thing, but then when you get out and it's game time and it's on the field, stuff is thrown at you that you weren't used to, right? But the more you play, the more you understand, the more you get the feel, you know what to do, you, you know what position to go to, all these kinds of things that you didn't know before, but in the meantime, while that's happening, it's hard. It's tough. We got to figure it out. We got to work it out. You're maturing. You're getting more experience. And it's the same thing with God. That's what's happening. When we go through things, we're maturing in him. It's strengthening our faith. It's building up our faith. And guess what? What did I say earlier? Faith pleases God. So when your faith is getting built up as you're going through things, God is getting happier. He is happy when we're going in faith. So we have to understand that it's a maturing process. And the reason why I'm saying this is because a lot of times we go through things and we don't understand why we're going through things. And like I said, a misconception is, you know, in the Western society, we think that, okay, God's the genie. We just make our wish and then he makes it happen. And it's like, that's not how it is. We are part of this process. And the most important part of the process is that we're maturing. We get closer to God when we mature because then we get to know who he is. We know how he works. We know what he likes, what he doesn't like. So we have to understand that. It's a way of uh, uh, getting deeper with the Lord than we had before. When everything is going fine, you know, you can still go deep with the Lord, but there's something different when stuff's not fine. I'll tell you a time. I was, uh, first time I ever had a kidney stone. Anybody ever have a kidney stone? Yeah, they're wonderful, aren't they? <laughs> well, the first time I had one, I have never heard of a kidney stone before. So I was, I was standing in line and I was getting ready to write a check for my daughter's uh, school because she was in preschool and I was in line ready to write a check. And then all of a sudden, boink, and I was like, Ooh. I got, oh man, did I pull my back out? You know, I thought I pulled my back out. And then all of a sudden the pain went from boink, to radiating pain. And I'm like sweating and I'm like in pain. I'm going, oh my gosh. Now you gotta understand, I've never had a kidney stone, didn't know what it was. So I have no clue what's going on. And so I'm driving home. I almost passed out. It wasn't really the smartest thing to do, but I, I had faith. <laughs> I drove home and I literally almost drove off the road. I got home, thank God, called my wife and said, Sylvia, come home now. She goes, what's wrong? Just get home now, click. You know, I, I, didn't, I was in so much pain. I was in agony. I went, just went to the living room and fell on the floor until she got there, just laying there. I literally thought, honestly, I literally thought I was going to die. It, 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 was, it was so painful, and I, I didn't know what to do. So Sylvia came, but in the meantime, this is the part I want to get across to you. While I'm they're laying on the floor in agony. 
I'm looking up. And I didn't see him fully, but I sensed him when I saw, saw Jesus. And just the peace came over me, a peace. In the middle of all that pain, all that agony, and all the unknown, a peace just came over me. That's the kind of peace I'm talking about that Jesus gives us when we know him. That's the same peace when Jesus was in the boat and the storm hit and the disciples are freaking out and Jesus is sleeping, not worried about it. See, that's the thing that we start maturing in. But that comes from our daily, continual, consistent time with the Lord. And it comes from our experience walking these things out, especially the tough things. The other thing I want to say too is it builds our confidence in him. See, when you've been through something, when something else comes along, you're way more confident. Your faith is at another level. And when your faith is at another level, the thing that I love about it the most, it's not even for me. It's for anybody else that I come in contact with. Anybody else that the Lord brings my way, my faith level is here. Theirs may be here, but like when we pray, we've been praying for Glenadel at the hospital. We prayed for Pastor Richard at the hospital and Shada and others for other things. When we pray, we're, I, a lot of times I'll say, Lord, we are lifting up their hands, just like Moses' arms were lifted up. We're lifting them up because they can't right now because they're weak. But guess what? We have the faith to do it. Why? Because we've been through stuff. We've matured. Does that make it easy? No, it doesn't make it easy. But it's important. It's important because right now with what's happening in the world, the world needs to see us in faith. The world needs to see us in faith. And one of the... Faith statements that we make is loving each other when we're bothered by each other. Oops. You didn't like that one, did you? Loving each other when we're bothered by each other. Because he says he knows us by the love that we have one for another. He didn't, say he, know, he didn't say that the world will know us by what we know. Hmm. Say, thank you, Pastor Sam. This is good stuff. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, in um, one of the misnomers that many believers have is the fact that when God speaks, all the time, it's good stuff. You're going to get a new job. You're going to be a prophet to the nations. Yes, that blessing is coming that you've been waiting for, right? Well, I, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but my Bible doesn't say that all the time. You know, God even tells us we're going to go through stuff. Did you realize that? Let's look at John 16, 33. I have said things to you that you may have peace. So he's telling us stuff, so we're going to have peace. Then he says, in the world, you will have tribulation. Prophesy, Jesus. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, the interesting parts of this is this. 
Yes, he tells us about this. We've heard this. Pastor Richard even quoted this last Sunday. All right? He tells us we're going to have the tribulation. But here's the thing. He says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In other words, brothers and sisters, he went through it too. And he overcame. We can do that because he is in us. We can do all things through Christ who is in us. Isn't that incredible? And so we have to understand that. Let me give you another example of it, my personal life. Back in 1980, I was working at a radio station. Yes, a radio station. And it was in San Bernardino, Q95 FM. Here I go. So I was working there. I was the program director. I had a music director, and we had some other uh, announcers, and I was in charge of that. Well, we had a new general manager come in, and so he was going to run things as far as being the general manager, my new boss. But before that, I was just praying. I wasn't thinking anything. I'm just praying. And the Lord tells me out of the blue, clear as a bell, you're going to be fired. <laughs> prophesy, Lord, prophesy. And I'm thinking, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, you know, I now I didn't go running around going, hey, everybody, I got a prophetic word from the Lord. I'm going to be fired. But it happened. So I get to the station, and the guy ends up firing me and the music director because he's bringing in his son to take our place. You got to understand. I didn't have a whole heck of a lot of money. I've got to move now. I don't know what's going on. That was scary. But I had this peace. Why? Because the Lord told me I was going to be fired. <laughs> and I knew. That doesn't mean I liked it. That's the other thing. We think we got to like it all the time. Okay? I'm going to tell you something. Get over your bad self. You're not going to like it all the time, what God tells you. Am I bursting somebody's bubble right now? I think I'm talking to myself. You don't like it all the time. Now, sometimes you do. I'm, again, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, okay? I'm not saying good things can't be said and whatnot. They definitely can. But at the same time, you got to understand, sometimes they don't. And that was one example. So let me tell you a little bit more of this story. So I felt like the Lord had us move back to the Central Coast, and I do, and I look in the want ads for radio, the radio want ads. Number one station on the Central Coast, looking for a program director. I'm going, huh. And it just stuck out to me. And this wasn't where God said, hey, that's your job. I sensed it. I said, I'm supposed to go there. So I did what every good person does. I don't call them. I just walk up to the, to the door and go, hey, I, see the, I saw the ad and I, I want to apply for the job. Usually you make an appointment for that. I didn't do that. I just walked right up and the general manager was there and he says, oh, let's go to lunch. We had a three-hour lunch and he goes, Let's listen to your tape. He listens to my air, they called it an air check at the time. Listened to my air check, said, man, you're, you, you are pretty good. And I go, well, do you think I was lying to you or what? I mean, and he goes, well, you are pretty good. He goes, you know what, you're hired. <laughs> Whoa. He hired me on the spot. I walked in off the street, y'all, off the street. Just going by what I felt the Lord was leading me to. And I didn't even know what was going to happen. Didn't expect that, but I was excited. 
Ended up working there for seven years. It was the number one radio station. I did a morning show. It was fun, and we had a good time. Did real well. But what I'm saying is, God, it started out not so good. You're going to be fired. Right? But see how fire turned to being hired? That was pretty good. Went from fired to hired, and it was God. And oh, by the way, I did make more money. So that wasn't too bad too. Now, Jesus gave us an example of what I'm saying to you, just so you know, it is in the scripture and I'm not just making stuff up. He said in Mark 14, starting in verse 32, and they went to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. See, Jesus went through distress and trouble as well. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was emotionally distraught at what was about to go down. And he was doing what his father told him to do. But the interesting thing is that he tries to talk daddy out of it. Don't we do that? Don't we do that? He says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet what I will, not what I will, but what you will. It's kind of interesting, and I, and I never really noticed this before. I've read this hundreds of times. But he's saying, he said, all things are possible for you. It's like that last plea. God, you, you know all things are possible. You could, you could change this whole scenario for me right now. But yet, the heart attitude was, but yet, I, I want to do what you want, Lord, Father. And that's the heart attitude we need to have. God wants us to have that. That's the maturity that I'm talking about because it changes our heart attitude. We have a different heart attitude. And then it goes on to say this, basically that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him, set before him, he endured the cross. See, Jesus knew, and a lot of times people talk about the joy that set before him is the fact that Jesus saw the church and that, you know, because he saw the church and what he's going to go through, die, be raised again so that we can be with him forever. And I believe that. I believe that. But I also believe that Jesus saw the joy of pleasing his father. He pleased his father. And so he wanted to do the will of the Father instead of his own will. Because, and you say, well, Pastor Sam, that's kind of a, a reach. Well, it might be a little reach, but look what happens in, in um, John 8. I'm going to look at verse 39. And he says, and I don't believe you guys have this, but uh, he says, and he who sent me is with me. There it is again. And this is Jesus talking to the disciples about he's going to be going to the cross, okay? And he says, he who sent me is with me while I'm going through this. He has not left me alone, for I always do things that are pleasing to him. Hmm. He does things that are pleasing to God, to his Father. 
That's a different heart attitude. That's the heart attitude we need to try to grasp hold of. Because that very heart attitude is the thing that is what makes us successful in our Christian walk in the kingdom. Because it's a heart attitude of pleasing him, not our own will. Does that make sense? Just another thing here, Paul also had prophecy about being chained up. I'm not going to go into all the detail because we only have a few more minutes. But basically, Agabus came and prophesied that, hey, you're going to be put in chains. And even Paul's uh, uh, brethren that was with him, when they heard the prophecy, tried to talk Paul from out of going where he was going to get put in chains. But Paul said, and he had the same attitude of heart as Jesus did. He said, ah, I'm, I'm, I got to do, I'm ready to die. I'm ready to do what I need to do because I'm doing it for my father. Right? Same heart attitude. Here's the thing. I want to, just a few things here. God wants us to know that he's with us so that, one, you can be with someone, that you can be with him and know him. Now, here's the thing that I, I want to get across to you. Even though God says that he's with you, that does not mean that you know him. We have to take those steps to know him. A good example of that is a marriage. How many, how many marriages do you know that they live together, but they don't know each other? Right? It's very, very quiet in here. But it's true. And so we have to take the steps of knowing him. You know, there's scripture that talks about the fact that you prophesied in my name, you cast out demons, you did all these great things that Jesus wants us to do, but he says, depart from me, I never knew you. That's how important knowing him is. And I'm telling you, that is why God is saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. You need to know me. You need to know me because when you know me, you're going to be more mature in me. You're going to know my likes and dislikes, and we're going to do great things together. But I can't do great things together if you're over there and I'm over here. But I'm with you, so let's talk. Let's get together. The final thing I'll just say about the whole thing is this. In Philippians chapter 4, it really describes the process that we, we need to go through on a regular basis, actually. It talks about, you know, we, we usually when we quote this, it's like we're, we're always quoting it because everybody's, you're, you're fearful at the time or you're anxious or you're going through stuff. And that's good. But I, I believe that this is something that we should be doing all the time, whether we're fearful or not says, be anxious, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with what Pastor Richard just talked about earlier, thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Let our requests be made known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, here's the thing. We have to do something in order to get that peace. We have to do something. And we shouldn't have to do something when it's an emergency. We should do something all the time. Then when it's emergency, it just clicks in automatically. But if you wait, until it's just an emergency. I'm not saying God won't be merciful and give you peace. 
but a lot will have to do on you. And so it's important for us to be consistent in this heart attitude of seeking God, praying to him, giving him all of our anxieties on a regular basis. And by the way, when you do that, you know, the thing is you start letting it go. You don't build it up and build it up, and then all of a sudden it explodes. You, 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 you let it go every day, every day. And what does that do? Here's what it does. It says, I have faith and I trust you, God. That's what it does. And that's what we need to do because, see, the reason why God is telling us that he, that he is with us is he wants us to get that. He wants us to have the peace. We've read in the scripture, when he said he's with us, he's always saying, peace. I'm saying it so you'll have peace. And that's my prayer for you tonight, is that you will get to that place, you will see it as maturing, and you will get to that place where you have that peace that goes beyond understanding, because we need that. And you know what? Not only we need it, people, the world needs to see it. They need to see it. Let's bow your heads and let's pray just for a moment. Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that as you're with us, you always encourage us. I thank you that you lead us, you guide us. I thank you, you, you uh, are an ever-present help in time of need. But Lord, I pray, even as some of us are in great need, some of us aren't in such a great need, but we all need you. We need you. We need the peace that goes beyond understanding. We need, Lord God, to express that peace so the world can see that we have peace when they don't. Thus, a holy jealousy can take place because they want what we have. And so, Father, I pray, Father, you just bless my brothers and sisters that are here, those that are watching. Father, just fill them to overflowing. Fill them with your peace. Fill them, Father. Strengthen them. Encourage them. And I pray, Father, that, Lord, that they will be hot after you. They'll realize that you are with them and that, Lord God, they will initiate a greater deeper, stronger love relationship with you, that you would be glorified in their lives and in the lives of the people that, Lord, they will have come to them. And we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, all righty. Thank you. God bless you. If you need prayer, you can come up. We can pray for you. But uh, have yourself a great night and the rest of your week. Thank you.